The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So today, it's sort of my favorite topic, dynamics. And uh, um, I think the main point I'm going to be making is that uh, mostly we use dynamics to explore what's in an effective Hamiltonian. We don't observe dynamics directly, and that's sort of the nature of the game for frequency domain spectroscopy. You measure a spectrum and you fit it. And once you have done that, you have an effective Hamiltonian. And once you have an effective Hamiltonian, you often don't know what's in it. It's a fit model. It can tell you a lot about what the molecule is actually doing. It takes the ingredients you put into it and uh, transforms them into something more than you knew initially. What is an effective Hamiltonian? It's a zero order model and it's some couplings. Now there are many possible zero order models and uh, the nice thing about an effective Hamiltonian is that it provides a fit to observations to the spectrum. It accounts for everything you observe. And, uh, and that's all you ask of it. But then you've got this thing and uh, it might be able to tell you about ways to, de to design clever experiments for uh, controlling uh, or controlling the dynamics of the system or visualizing what's going on, observing the emergence of qualitatively new classes of motion in the molecule. And it's really, a, to me, a, an amazing thing that a stupid model can uh, convey deep insights that uh, were not explicitly sought when you constructed the model. And so, you know, what I'm going to do is really an unconventional lecture because uh, most of the time when people talk about dynamics, the dynamics are the thing that uh, one measures, or it's the endpoint rather than, uh, or rather than a byproduct of what we do in the spectrum. And so, um, anyway, we'll see whether I can give you some surprising insights. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just on the first page of the notes is kind of an outline of all of the things that I plan to touch on, and let's uh, uh, and let's talk through this. The first dynamical example is quantum beats because a quantum beat is the first and simplest case where you have a two-level system and it does something which is different from an eigenstate. And there's a lot of insights from that. And the next key thing is to talk about the concept of a bright state and a dark state. There is nothing absolute about brightness and darkness. It depends on the definition of the experiment. Some of the most important developments in small and medium-sized molecule spectroscopy come from ways in which uh, people have uh, uh, cleverly created new classes of bright states because uh, each class of bright state uh, enables a very specific pluck of this system and then you can observe how the, the pluck, uh, or how the system responds to that pluck and that can provide 
uh, insights into important coupling mechanisms, but also can reveal energy flow pathways, the, the uh, occurrence of unexpected things. And uh, uh, the experiment that, uh, um, well, I mean, there's several kinds of plucks. One kind of pluck involves uh, large amplitude local mode excitations, which is what people initially did in the early days of dynamics when people were trying to do bond-specific chemistry and there were all of these RH stretches that appeared uh, in the visible region and there was a belief that if you could just use those to put a lot of energy into a, uh, a single vibrational mode and that would activate the molecule for uh, chemistry at that location and uh, uh, that went for a long way but stretching motions, especially on the periphery, periphery of a molecule, are not very strongly coupled into the many body dynamics that a molecule can undergo. And so I invented stimulated emission pumping, which enabled uh, a bright state that involved uh, large amplitude skeletal modes and uh, uh, Instead of just being able to excite high overtones of R8 stretches, you could excite several different classes of modes and you could even know what the nature of that was initially because it's governed by the Frank Kahneman principle. Brooks Pate uh, had a kind of pluck that had to do with knowing the rotational constant of different isomers. And so by uh, looking at the rotational spectrum in the uh, uh, region of the rotational constants for different uh, isomers, he's visualizing different parts, you know, he, he separates one isomer from another and th that's really, uh, to me, a mind-blowing uh, sort of pluck. Okay, so the concept of bright and dark states is going to be really important. Then there's another issue and that is non-radiative decay. Um, there was, around the time that I was starting my scientific career, there was an enormous dispute about what do uh, polyatomic molecules that are electronically excited do? They uh, you, you know you've excited a certain number of them with, uh, by, uh, uh, when you absorb photons and when you do that you expect a certain number of photons out and you also expect a certain decay rate. And molecules seem to decay faster than you expected and the quantum yields were very small. And there was a huge controversy about what is, what is the reason for this. And one, uh, the best thing that people could come up with was <clears throat> that polyatomic molecules, electronically excited, are exceptionally sensitive to quenching. And all of these issues, these photochemical issues, uh, could be resolved simply by going to lower, low enough pressure that eventually you would get out of the quenching regime and all of these anomalies would be resolved. And that turns out to be wrong. But the people who believed in quenching, collisional quenching, were exceedingly resistant because if, if there's this idea that a molecule is exceptionally sensitive, well then you can never prove you're wrong because you could just say, well, it's more sensitive and you haven't gone to low enough pressure and as you go to low, lower and lower pressure, signal goes away and so one needed an answer to this, an explanation that says, okay, oh, we can account for these phenomena and that's Bix and Jortner theory and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, maybe I should just launch into the actual discussion rather than uh, talking through the outline. So, so let's talk about 
here we have some eigenstate. And uh, an eigenstate is stationary. We've, I've said this many, many times. It does not decay. And uh, uh, so we could say that we have a, a solution to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which is really the only equation there is, that corresponds to a single vibrationally pure state. And so that would then be just the vibrationally pure state with a, this exponential factor. But we can ask, well, is this going to decay? Well, the way you ask that is you just calculate the, uh, the probability of finding the system in that state. And uh, so what you end up getting is the original state. And this means take the complex conjugate. This means integrate over all coordinates. And so the time dependence is going, has gone away. And so the probability of finding the system in an eigenstate, even if you do time dependent quantum mechanics, is one. It's independent of time. Um, and uh, uh, does it move? Well, one way of asking if it moves, you just take the expectation value of the displacement and uh, so if it's a single, eigen, a single vibrational eigenstate, well then uh, this thing has a selection rule delta v of plus and minus one and so not only does the time dependence go away but uh, this thing results in Zero. It, if you're asking, is there, if you had a pure vibrational state, time dependent, uh, is there motion? Well, not only is there no motion, the system is at, uh, has an expectation value of position of zero. Well, why is that? Well, it's a harmonic oscillator. It's in a symmetric potential, symmetric about zero. Of course, the average position is zero. Well, suppose it's not in a pure vibrational eigenstate. Suppose it's in a, uh, a state which is a mixture of two vibrational levels. So we could say psi j is a little bit of psi v, uh, phi v, uh, plus 1 minus alpha square square root v plus 1. Okay, well, if we do this, these are not, uh, these are vibrational, uh, eigen, uh, vibrational basis states. We have nice selection rules of the coordinate operator for these things. We can write the time dependent wave function and when we evaluate what happens, we find that uh, um, for this state, the expectation value of the coordinate is not equal to zero, but it's not moving. Now that's telling you that we can create a wave packet in any position we want uh, by making a linear combination of zero-order vibrational states, but uh, uh, we don't get motion unless we make, uh, make a superposition of eigenstates as opposed to a superposition of basis functions. Okay, so now we come to quantum beats. Suppose you have a, a three-level system like this, and you have a, a short pulse of radiation. The Fourier transform limit of the short pulse is sufficiently broad as to overlap the two levels. So now you have, and let's say one of, uh, 
Um, so these are two eigenstates, but they could have come from uh, two zero order states uh, that, that interacted and repel each other. So this is, uh, let's say this is phi bright and this is phi dark. And there's some coupling matrix element between them to, giving, to give rise to two eigenstates. So what that just means is we have a bright state which has an allowed transition from the initial state and we have a dark state that has a forbidden transition from the initial state. And this is all very familiar but I think it, you know, it, it's, it's important to view this in a, in a, uh, a picture of, of increasing complexity. So if the nature of the experiment is a short uh, uh, time pluck, you pluck the bright state. So so what you make at t equals zero is the bright state, which is not an eigenstate. It's expressed as a linear combination of two eigenstates and uh, uh, what did I, yes. So we have So if we construct our experiment plucks the system exploiting a particular state which we have decided is bright, and we have to express that as a linear combination of eigenstates, and then we know what psi of t is. So psi of t is going to be alpha psi j e to the minus i e j t over h bar plus 1 minus alpha squared root, uh, psi k e to the minus i e k e over h bar. And so now we have a wave function which has two different time evolving factors. And if we ask, well, what is, uh, what is the probability density. So if we ask the probability density, uh, no integration, we're going to get an alpha squared factor times psi j squared and we'll have a 1 minus alpha squared factor times psi k squared and then we'll have some cross terms. And as long as uh, we're not integrating over uh, coordinates, the fact that this and this are different eigenstates and are necessarily orthogonal, there will be something that survives. And so we'll get two because we have two different cross terms. Um, and uh, well, actually, I don't want to write it that way. I don't want to. So um, we have a, a complex conjugate of this, and so we'll have alpha star psi j star e to the uh, plus i e j t over h bar, and then a 1 minus alpha squared um, square root psi k star, and now overall we have the uh, I E J minus E K T over H bar. Oops, no complex conjugate here. And then we have the other term, which is the complex conjugate of that. Okay, and so we do a little algebra here and we what we can do is we can separate the sum of these two terms into a real and an imaginary part and uh, uh, we end up just getting uh,
for this problem, we, we get uh, some constant stuff plus twice the real part of alpha star 1 minus alpha squared square root psi j star psi k and cosine omega k j t minus or plus plus 2 times the imaginary part of the same thing times sine omega k j t. So we get motion. Okay, so this probability density is a complicated thing. It's, it's a function of coordinate. Uh, it's got a constant function of coordinates. Then it's got uh, the function of the coordinates multiplied by two different time-dependent factors. Now, uh, often uh, we have a Hamiltonian uh, which enables us to say everything is real. So there is no imaginary part. But often the nature of the problem when there isn't just a single bright state, but there's say two bright states or several partially bright states, uh, there, there's many possibilities for uh, what these mixing coefficients can be. Okay, so we've been talking about this quantity but what about the quantity of, what is the probability of finding the system in the bright state? Okay, so this is a probability density. It's a function of time and position. This is going to be simply a function of time. And so that involves calculating a different quantity, which is the uh, probability so we have the time evolving wave function and we have the initial bright state and uh, so this is what this symbol means. It says what is the probability of the time evolving state overlapping with the zero order bright state? And we know that this is going to start at one and it's going to oscillate and so we can calculate that and uh, um, so, um, and, uh, well, so a trivial calculation gives uh, that this is going to, I don't want to write all that stuff. Um, well, let's do it anyway. One plus twice the mixing coefficient to the fourth power minus two times the mixing coefficient squared. So that's the time independent factor. And then we have the cross term, which is 2 alpha squared, 1 minus alpha squared, cosine omega k j of t. So the probability, the time evolving probability of this quantum beating system is uh, a constant term and an oscillatory term. Now, it's a probability. So what do we know about probabilities? One, they're ne never negative. Two, they're real. They're never greater than one. And so this thing ought to behave in such a way that uh, uh, the, this oscillates somewhere between zero and one. And uh, it has this, this periodicity which is determined by the separation between the two zero order, uh, two eigenstates that are present in the bright state. Okay, well I'm going to make an assertion. The modulation depth of this thing is greatest when alpha is equal to plus or minus one over square root of two. When that's true, uh, this 
Well, what we get is 1 half times 1 plus cosine omega kj t. And this, in fact, oscillates between 0 and 1. And at t equals 0, it's 1. And uh, uh, the, you can figure out what the period of this is. And so it re returns to 1 uh, at every period of the oscillation at omega kj. And, uh, and so this leads to the idea of population quantum beats, or so quantum beats. Um, if we have a bright state and a dark state, well then this looks like the system is periodically, uh, it starts out in the bright state, because we know that's what we plucked. It leaves the bright state and it comes back. And so we have what's called population quantum beats. And if it's a bright state, you've excited a, this quantum beating system, it's going to fluoresce. And the fluorescence intensity is going to be decreasing exponentially, but it's going to have superimposed on the exponential decay, it's going to have, whoops, it's going to have 100% quantum beats. So, um, and no matter how you look at this, if you excite a bright state, you can look at the fluorescence from any direction and by choosing some direction and some polarization, nothing changes. You have 100% amplitude beats uh, um, and, uh, but then there's another thing. There's, polarization quantum beats. I mean, suppose you have, say, m equals 0, and you have, uh, uh, you use perpendicular polarization, and you excite uh, to m equals minus 1 and m equals plus 1. So suppose you had X or Y polarization, well then a pulse could produce two levels of different M. And so then, depending on how you look at the fluorescence, uh, in what direction, with what polarization, you will see beats always at the same frequency, but the amplitude of the, the, uh, the, amplitude of the modulation will depend on uh, uh, what polarization state you're looking at. And so uh, what happens is for polarization quantum beats, uh, the angular distribution of the fluorescence uh, is not isotropic. The total intensity of the fluorescence as a function of time is uh, simple exponential, but because you've excited the sample anisotropically, it's a beacon that's rotating and you're seeing how this thing is moving. So there's, there's this simple idea that came from some of the earliest time-dependent experiments where one observed two classes of quantum beat. One where the fluorescence was turning on and off, and the other where the fluorescence was moving around in a, in a complicated angular way. And uh, a, lot of, a lot was learned about that. Okay. So this is Okay, so, so I've been talking about a quantum beating system where we have two states. One state 
does not radiate. Now, uh, it does not radiate at all, as opposed to it does not radiate into your detector. I mean, you could have a detector which is sensitive to radiation from one of the eigenstates and not from the other, as opposed to uh, a system where the, uh, there is no fluorescence from one of the two, two zero-order states because, let's say, it's a singlet and a triplet, and the triplet has a long lifetime and the singlet has a short lifetime. And so, to a good approximation, one radiates, the other one doesn't. And uh, um, so, if you knew the radiative decay rates for the bright state and the dark states, what would you see in the fluorescence? What would be the modulation depth? What would be the uh, decay of the, uh, the non-beating part of the fluorescence? And what would be the decay rate of the uh, uh, beat? So you can express everything in terms of the uh, two-level problem and the properties of these two zero-order states. And I don't recommend, I'm not going to require you to hand this in, but I do recommend that you explore this problem because uh, there's going to be something about the decay of the non-beating part, which is built from these, the lifetimes of these two states. And there's going to be something about the decay of the quantum beating uh, uh, part of the system, uh, the fluorescence, which is built from these two lifetimes. And you have an overdetermined system. If you know something about the, um, it's really two levels, one bright, one dark, uh, um, you should be able to, to f develop a relationship between the decay of the beat and the decay of the non-beat. Okay. So. I mean, you could also do a problem where you have two bright states. One, they both radiate at different rates, but one radiates uh, at a, at a, uh, in a wavelength region that your detector sees, and one radiates in a wavelength region the detector doesn't see. And again, how would that uh, translate into the observable decays of the non-beat and beat? Okay, so now, non-radiative decay. And as I said, the 1960s were, uh, was a period where people were fighting about non-radiative decay. So thermodynamically, you can know the energy at which a molecule a polyatomic molecule will, will break, either by dissociating or by ionizing. And so, if you excite from the ground state to some excited state, and up here is the lowest fragmentation channel, either dissociation or ionization. So, if you excite from here to here, you know you're making something that isn't going to go away. And uh, uh, you also know that you can measure the absorption coefficient for this transition. And people did that a lot uh, up until, uh, well, people continue to do it, but it was, it was one of the standard things you could do. And so you did it because, you know, you, and so up until the, the, the mid-60s, there were an awful lot of measurements of absolute absorption coefficients for polyatomic molecules. And there's a simple theory that relates the absorption coefficient, which is an Einstein B coefficient, to the decay rate, which is an Einstein A coefficient. And uh, one can do the theory well enough so that if you know 
what the absorption coefficient is, and you know that this thing can only radiate to uh, levels that you have understood, then you can calculate what, it's, uh, what the radiative lifetime will be. And there isn't any, any slop about that. And if you know what the absorption coefficient is and you know what the pressure is, you know how many molecules you've excited. So you can measure the fluorescence quantum yield and you can do it the absolute way where you measure the number of photons in and the number of photons out. Or you can measure it a clever way, which is uh, the predicted, so you can have the, uh, um, uh, radiative decay rate plus total decay rate. This ratio is the, is the quantum yield also. So we have a radiative plus non-radiative decay. This is radiative plus non-radiative. This is just one of the two. But before people admitted there could be a non-radiative decay, uh, the only thing people did was to measure photons in, photons out and measure lifetimes. And what they found was that the lifetimes for, or the, uh, the decay rate for fluorescence from a polyatomic molecule excited uh, to a non-fragmenting state was always faster. Short, the lifetime was always shorter than what you calculate. And the quantum yield was always less than one. And usually by enormous factors. And so the question was, well, why is this? And at that time, you know, the eigenstate picture was the whole story, and the eigenstates, you know, all an eigenstate can do, it's not really an eigenstate if it fluoresces. But so we fix that up. We say eigenstates can fluoresce by some magic. Uh, but then, you know, it was a simple theory, and uh, why did this happen? And so, uh, there was a group of people of whom the person who taught me quantum mechanics, Martin Guterman, was the leader, believed that this was all due to collisional quenching. And uh, along came Dixon and Jordner. There was a lot, there were a lot of people, and there's actually, uh, and Klemper. All of them made contributions. The first one was probably Wills Robinson, but the, person, the people who got credit for this idea was, uh, were Bixen and Jordner. And what Bixen and Jordner said is, let's, let's generalize on uh, quantum beats. Suppose you have a bright state and you have a dense manifold of dark states. Not one, but many. And in order, there was, this was before we had good computers either also. So it was necessary to write this problem in a form where you could solve it exactly without using a computer. And so what they did is they said, okay, we have a dense manifold of dark states, equally spaced, and they all have the same coupling matrix element with the bright state. This is an exactly soluble toy problem. And uh, so one can then uh, uh, distribute the bright character so you get a new manifold of states where there's one more, one more state than, than dark states. And their bright uh, character is distributed in a Lorentzian way. And uh, so if you were to excite it with a short pulse, you would make a coherent superposition of many eigenstates. So many eigenstates, well, they're, they're so densely packed that this would, be, this would have quantum beats. But the density of states was so high that the quantum beats would be at a long time compared to the radiative lifetime. And so 
you don't see any quantum beads. So what ends up happening is you create this uh, coherent superposition of many zero order states and it dephases. And that dephasing time means that the brightness has, you started out phasing up, you have a bright state. The brightness goes away, it doesn't go away, it just dephases and so that instead of having all of your brightness working for you, you've got, you've divided up into many little pieces. And so each of these states decays slowly, uh, and, but that's going in the wrong direction because we want the lifetime, the lifetime to be short. But the brightness is distributed over a big spectral width and we forget the fact that it's discrete. And so what ends up happening is that the Fourier transform of uh, what you see is, and then maybe at, at, because the levels are closely spaced, there's a little bit of, you know, there's a little bit of oscillation at long time. Uh, but mostly the fluorescence is, you know, the, the bright character is dephased before you get any kind of partial recurrence. And this explains, so we have the, uh, the quantum yield is going to be the radiative over the non-radiative plus radiative. And this explains the quantum yield, number of photons out compared to the number of photons in. You, it's really not quite right because all of the photons will come out, but they come out after the molecules hit the wall or left the field of view, and so you've, uh, uh, they explain everything and they explained it in this simple model. Okay. There's another way of dealing with uh, problems like this. I mean, Bixen and Jordaner said we had a bright state and we had a dense manifold of dark states. You can treat this in a different way. You can say we have two states. We have uh, a state that is, uh, I'm going to draw the, the width like this. We have two states, one sharp, one broad. And we have, instead of a many level problem, we have a two level problem. We have a Hamiltonian that involves the interaction between two states that ha each have width. That one does this by making the Hamiltonian have complex diagonal elements. So what you say is, uh, well, you know that the uh, uh, decay of an eigenstate uh, is given by, uh, or the, the time dependence is e to the minus i h i i t over h bar. So in the diagonal representation, this is just uh, the diagonal energy. Uh, and uh, so this is not decaying, this is oscillating. But if we say h i i is e zero i, or e e i, uh, minus i gamma i over two, then I switched from i to j. Sorry about that. Um, j j j j. j. Um, then what you find is psi star j of t, psi j of t becomes psi j squared e to minus gamma t over h bar. Because you have made the energy complex and this exponential factor here has an i in front of it, this one 
does the usual thing when you take the complex, complex conjugate. And so when you take the uh, square modulus, the energy factors cancel out. But uh, this cancels the i and converts an exponential factor, an oscillating ex exponential, to a decaying exponential. And so, and the fact that you have a factor of two here is just to make it come out so that the, the lifetime of the probability is, uh, so the, the radiate of lifetime is going to be h bar over gamma. And so, the, and this is the width, and so a uh, large width corresponds to a short lifetime. And so this is a way of taking a many level problem and converting it to a two level problem. Because what you do is you can say, okay, I have a bright state and it's pretty sharp, whether it's infinitely sharp or slightly sharp, it doesn't matter, and it's interacting with a dark state which is broad. And so what you've done is you've taken the dense manifold of dark states and made it into one state. And so now we have a two-level problem where we have E1 minus I gamma 1 over 2, E2 minus I gamma 2 over 2, V12, V12. That's the effect of Hamiltonian. And so you can find the energy levels and, uh, and eigenstates of this two-level problem. And so you can, you can see that, you know, from what you know about the two-level problem, that when there is an interaction between level one and level two, in addition to uh, level repulsion we, uh, we, and level mixing, we get a sharing of the width. The problem is that there's two limits. There's a strong coupling and weak coupling limit. In the strong coupling limit, which corresponds to where V is large compared to the difference in widths, then everything you know from the two-level problem goes over. The widths get shared, the levels repel, everything is simple. However, in the weak coupling limit, when the coupling matrix element is small compared to the difference in the width, what you have is a completely different system that, you're unexpected, that is unexpected, but is also correct based on uh, uh, calculations where you don't make this uh, complex Hamiltonian. So you, you have a broad state and you have a sharp state. And so you can arrange the relative energies of the broad state and the sharp state, say, by changing rotational quantum number. And what you see is that the, broad sta the sharp state can tune through the broad state without any sharing of width and without any level repulsion. And this is completely unexpected, and it leads to a profound change in the dynamics, which is actually true. And it's a very useful thing when you're dealing with many, many level systems. It's often a wonderful thing to map that onto an exactly soluble problem. And you get insights. And uh, it turns out the algebra for, si for solving this two level problem with complex diagonal elements is not so trivial. It is trivial in the strong coupling limit. In the weak coupling limit, you have to do things a little bit carefully. And, but it is a two-by-two two problem, and you can ask a computer to solve it, or you can do the algebra. It's all in my book. So I like that because it provides a way of solving a complicated problem by reducing it to a standard problem. Okay. So now we're done with the introductory material. And what time is it? I mean, this is really two lectures, so I, I do plan to talk to Five after? 59. 59. Okay, so let me just say a few words and then we'll stop. So we start with a spectrum. 
And we fit that spectrum to some effective Hamiltonian model. That's what we do as spectroscopists. And what you often find is when you attempt to fit the spectrum to an effective Hamiltonian, there are things that, that don't work. There are discrepancies. And so you add some uh, new terms and you have a more complicated effect of Hamiltonian. And there's two classes of things. One is local, where there's an accidental degeneracy. So you just put in a, a, a two-level system and you, you, you patch it up. And the other is global. And one example of a global effect is polyads, where there's a group of vibrational levels that are systematically near degenerate and they're coupled by a relatively low order and harmonic term in the Hamiltonian. And so when you have these global things, you get what are called polyads, and they're multiple and harmonic resonance interactions. So you, you throw them in, you throw them in. Usually, you start out with only one anharmonic coupling term. And most of the, uh, you know, uh, most of the early examples of anharmonic couplings in infrared spectroscopy, there's just a single anharmonic coupling term. But, so you, there's one, you've, you've patched it up. There's another one, you throw it in. And soon you've got an effective Hamiltonian that fits the spectrum perfectly. But you don't know anything more than it fits the spectrum. And so you really want some tools to interpret HF or to, to devise experiments that will enable you to make assignments that you couldn't make otherwise. So there'll be diagnostic patterns in certain spectra that explore, that are produced by selecting certain bright states and you can uh, you can do experiments based on the effect of Hamiltonian and choice of different bright states that will enable you to make assignments. And you could also uh, uh, do this to control the dynamics because uh, I mean, you, you might want to create a lot of excitation in a particular part of the molecule and how is this going to happen? So you have a, a group of strongly coupled states uh, you could couple, you could excite this one or this one or this one. You could excite some linear combination of them. What will happen? Well, that's what the dynamic tools are for. It's not that we observe the dynamics. We observe in the frequency domain the consequence of the dy dynamics. The frequency domain tells us what happened. And we can use the dynamical tools on the effect of Hamiltonian that has been determined from the frequency domain spectrum to learn stuff, to learn whether there is something that happened in our effect of Hamiltonian that we ought to know about other than just some numerical representation of the spectrum. And so there's two kinds of dynamical measures, dynamics in uh, coordinate space and in state space. And that's, I mean, uh, tomorrow morning I will go through a large number of these dynamical measures and talk about what they tell us. But the thing that's unique about the way I'm going to do it is that I'm a spectroscopist. I have determined the effect of Hamiltonian and I'm now probing it to find out what, what it's made out of. What does it really tell us? It's more than just a bunch of numbers. So anyway, that's what I hope to do. And there are a lot of dynamical measures. They look similar, but they tell you different things. And I don't know how far I'm going to get, but that's what I plan to do.